Welcome to Digital Futures, where we demystify emerging and future advances to show you how they'll impact your day-to-day -day life. Now, this batch of mini-specials on the digital economy sees us bantering with mega-influencers from the wider industry on the future of the sector and how digital technologies have transformed nearly every aspect of our lives. In my hot seat today is a highly brilliant woman who I'm confident will bring all of this to life and give us her take on the subject. Emma, thanks for offering to banter with us on the series thanks today. For having me. Now, the news is full of great stories about the skyrocketing growth of digital, spectacular startup success stories, and things like that. But is this an entirely realistic picture of the state of business, particularly with startups in the UK? Well, my understanding is that the startup community in the United Kingdom is bigger than the USA, and that is something to be very proud of because obviously our population is just one small uh, percentage point of that of the US. So I think we should be very, very proud of the culture that we have in the United Kingdom um, and the proactivity being shown to support younger businesses because, of course, it is the younger businesses that are the pipeline of the future acquisition targets, acquirers, IPO candidates, uh, and it's critical for our economy. Talking about the wider digital economy, let's say globally, rather than restricting it to the UK or Europe, what is the role of big business and government here in driving that growth? Uh, that's a, a big question and I think um, my answer would be that there's huge symbiosis between all parties. Uh, the private sector and the public sector need to work to a degree hand in hand but the private sector typically moves faster than the public sector. So private businesses um, are obviously unencumbered from a lot of the um, rules and regulations that government organisations work by. But in terms of taking smaller startup businesses or medium sized businesses and very large enterprises, I believe that there's a, a natural symbiosis. Now, Emma, those of us working in tech buy into digital advances quite easily because we understand them as well. We're not sort of flummoxed by them. But a lot of everyday citizens that I constantly speak to do confess that they can feel a little alienated from the world of gadgetry and gizmos yeah. and all these advances. How do you think we can bring along non-digital natives for this ride? I think it's understandable. I think really anything that we don't necessarily interact with every day can be a little terrifying in the same way that you could probably talk to a lot of startups and they would say, I'm a little bit intimidated by numbers and financial statements. Really, actually, it's simple mental arithmetic, but it has a veneer that makes us all a little bit nervous, perhaps. I think it might be the same for technology. One of the things that industries and sectors can be quite good at doing is giving names, words and acronyms to things which actually are really easy to understand but unless you have been explained what that means, doesn't it can mean be, but doesn't you, mean, yeah. you know, the cloud. I remember, you know, someone saying something about the cloud and having to explain what that was. It really, I think, is just a case of these things being made accessible. But your average person, you know, your average parent, grandparent is on Facebook, is sending text messages, using Skype. is using yeah. Skype. You know, Skype is almost a verb these days, so it's, it's starting to resonate. I think we have to just remember as an industry that it's the, you know, using the acronyms, chatting amongst ourselves, speaking very fast about the new and latest thing that we find really exciting because we see it every day. Just, you know, taking the time to explain things. It's an inevitability, I think, that most of these things become common vernacular to everybody because who doesn't have a smartphone these days? My pet peeve is uh, the phrase growth hacker and disruptive innovation. Those are your pet peeves. So over abused. Well, the thing is, is that sometimes you need to put a label on something that is incredibly simple. And for those of us that are doing something that might be either complicated or whatever it may be, may have an air of mystery, sometimes you really just need to explain what something does. You know, put the right label on the tin and, and, tin and everybody will understand. Interesting. I like that viewpoint. Now, Emma, I know that you're very intensely passionate about diversity in business and you kind of champion that. Um, research from Startups Accelerator Wira recently showed that with digital startups, over 79% of them felt that diversity actually just helped their businesses compete. It just made good business sense. Yeah. So it's not just a nice to have, is it? Diversity is good for business. At the end of the day, we're talking about a digital economy, you and I, and data often provides the answer to everything. So on a data front, diversity is good for business, whether it's gender, whether it's race, whether it is culture or language. Um, businesses that have a diverse board perform better, 
Um, men and women typically have skills that they are better at championing inside businesses. So it doesn't come as any surprise to me that those findings, um, you know, at the height, almost 80% show that diverse, they understand that diversity is good for business. The other thing is, is that the, in this day and age, you pretty much launch as a global business if you're a digital business. You could be above your garage in your home, you could be in London, you could be anywhere else around the UK or Europe and the world, and you have a lot more accessibility to everything than you did when I necessarily started a business. So your engineers may not be English and may not speak English. Your business partner may be on the other side of the world and perhaps you communicate by Skype. I think that there are, business is a, lot more, is, is a lot more borderless, especially for millennials and for a lot of the startups that I see in the ecosystem here. So it comes as an, it's, it's an obvious and natural thing to accept that diversity is helpful because as we said at the beginning, too many cooks around the table, same broth. And really, that doesn't really, that's not the secret sauce for an exciting business. Emma, talk to us about Enterprise Jungle and where you want to take it. So Enterprise Jungle is a business that I co-founded and essentially we are an innovation house and we take data and we build solutions for very large enterprises that help them run better, faster, simpler. In terms of where I want to take the company, you know, I'm an ambitious person, as is my co-founder, so our intention is to scale and be significant. Equally, I'd say that if anybody knows me, and in terms of choosing me to be here today, you know, you've had a look at my past. Um, whilst I love my day job, I am also a capitalist. So, um, you know, we're, we're growing fast and aggressively, and I love that, and I intend to work harder and faster for that to continue to scale. Good, kudos to you. We need more of that. Now, Emma, there's a lot of commentary out there about rallying more young girls to consider careers in STEM. And I think it'd be really helpful to get your take on whether some of this is actually a bit campaignish or irksome, or actually we do need more women to speak out about bringing more women into the sector given the gender disparity and what might we do to sustainably move the needle on just bringing more women into business in general? Well, to take the younger people as you, um, you know, you've said about school and STEM, the reality is this, in your 13 and 14 and you're a teenage girl, the chances are you may not necessarily clock engineering as something that you want to do. You need to make it accessible. I didn't have any incubators, I didn't have any STEM academies, none of these things existed when I was at school. They didn't exist really when I was at university. And we think about accelerators for when you're starting a business, those didn't exist either. I think it's really important to teach people what other options are out there. I remember the only thing I did have was one exposure to a couple of businesses when I was 16. We were taken on a short trip, there were this group that did uh, that did trips for young girls to teach them that they should also go into business. And that opened my eyes and I saw things that I hadn't seen before. So I think that you do need to engage and talk to girls about STEM. The reality is, is that they are actually interacting with technology on an everyday basis, whether it's Facebook, whether it's typing their, you know, I used to write my homework on a book, you know, on a big sheet of paper. And now, of course, all homework is done on a computer. So I think that it's absolutely critical, though, to explain what it is you need to do if you might be interested to do something later on. But this is on the agenda now. You know, if you talk about diversity, it's in the newspapers every single day. It never was when I used to read the newspaper. In terms of getting more women into business, again, my point is pretty much the same. When I was starting my career and I was, you know, I started working at 16, flipping burgers, and by 21 I'd got into the city doing finance. But at that time, again, you no one talked about diversity, no one talked about statistics and data, no one talked about women's organisations, there was no mentor that you could go and talk to and ask questions to. So the fact that it's so on the agenda, I think, is the thing that will affect change. And it's our responsibility to talk to our daughters, to talk to our sons, and to educate about all of the different opportunities out there, because the future really does involve technology wherever it is you plan to work. Absolutely, and technology being so pervasive. You can't escape it. Absolutely, that's almost insidious, invisible even, uh, massively helps there. Well look, I did languages at university. I wish in retrospect, well, I don't have any regrets in hindsight, but if I was to do it again now, I wouldn't be doing modern languages. I would be, I would be coding, I would be learning those languages. And I think that that is something that's going to come very quickly because children will understand if they want to have a job in technology, if they want to build the next enterprise software firm or consumer tech firm, those are skills they need to have. But it's definitely our responsibility to teach uh, and to educate and to enlighten. I concur with that. Emma, thank you so much for being on Digital Features. It's been fantastic. Thanks for having me. Today.